good to see each one of you tonight. Welcome to the service. I'll read a couple of things to you. This one is just called the cross. It says the cross was never dear to me until I knew his grace. Taking my sin and shame on him, dying there in my place. How long I failed to realize he died that I might be the righteousness of God in him since he was sin for me. I cannot understand it yet, no matter how I try, but to the cross I go to live since he went there to die. I thought that was really good. And this one is just called the blood. It says, the blood assures me, it cleanses all my sin, its covering is my plea, it brings salvation free. The blood procures for me protection from all ill, a refuge from the gale, a safety through the veil, and the blood secures for me a home in heaven free. A joy that never will cease and everlasting peace. The blood assures me, procures for me, and secures for me. Let's sing this evening 231. 231. You know, this is a, uh, it's a very old hymn, but I want to tell you this. This hymn is rich, and I was looking at the words uh, of it again, and it just kind of struck me afresh and anew, the, uh, the powerful message of this hymn. It'll bless your heart if you think about the words as you sing them. Let's stand together. Blessed Redeemer. for sinners death on the cross that he might save them from endless loss blessed redeemer precious redeemer seems now I see him on Calvary's tree wounded and pleading for sinners pleading blind and unheeding dying for me father forgive them thus did he pray e'en while his life blood flowed fast away praying for sinners while in such woe no one but jesus ever loved so blessed redeemer precious redeemer Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. I want you to think about this third stanza. Because this ought to be the, this ought to be each one of our hearts right here as we think about uh, what the Lord has done for us. Let's sing it. Oh, how I love Him.
so loved us that you gave your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay our sin debt, to pay a debt that he did not owe, but a debt that we could not pay. Father, we're so thankful that Christ became sin for us, that he took our place, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him and through him and by him. How thankful we are for our blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer. He is indeed precious to us tonight. We thank you for the full and free forgiveness of sin that we know through Christ tonight. Lord, as we gather together and as we observe your table tonight, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you'd draw us close together as a church body, a church family. And Father, we ask that you would draw us close to thee. And Father, may each one of us worship thee in spirit and in truth tonight. And may we come with thankful hearts, remembering and rejoicing in what Christ has done and secured for each one of us. We thank you. We ask your blessings upon the service in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, the first few verses tonight. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That's a wonderful verse right there. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. You see, since we're in Christ, the law has been fulfilled. Christ fulfilled all of the law. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't be saved and not have the Spirit of Christ, not have the Holy Spirit in you. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Hymn 451, as we continue singing. Again, I want you to think about the words of this hymn as we sing them together. That first stanza is very powerful. They're, they're all powerful. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. We have a double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Let's sing that together. in song. Take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We began considering the question, why did the Lord leave us the ordinance of His Supper, the Lord's Supper? And we saw, first of all, it is so that the bride, and we are the bride, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are part of the bride of Christ. And we said, first of all, he left us the ordinance of his supper so that his bride would never forget the price that the bridegroom paid to secure his bride, that we'd never forget his broken body, that we would never forget his shed blood. We would never forget the ultimate, perfect, pure, final sacrifice that he made on the cross to procure, to secure our salvation. We see that as we begin reading in verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Very clearly. The Lord said, I want you to observe this in remembrance of me. As my bride, I want you to remember the price that I paid to secure you as my bride. And he speaks of his broken body, the fact that he went to the cross. And there on the cross, his body was broken and he gave his life and he died in order to secure us to be his bride. And so he said, this do in remembrance of me. Why did the Lord leave us the ordinance of his supper so that we would always remember? We'd always remember the price that he paid on the cross of Calvary to secure us as his bride. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. You see, he, he left us this ordinance lest we should forget, lest we should fail to remember his precious blood that he shed in order to secure our salvation, in order to secure us as his bride. Now, last time we went into some detail about uh, the words New Testament. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. That cup, it represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the new covenant that our Lord Jesus Christ established when he shed his blood on the cross, doing away forever with that old Levitical system of continual animal sacrifices and establishing the one supreme, the final, the perfect, the forever settled sacrifice of the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary as he gave his life and as he shed his blood to take away our sin. That, that old covenant, that first covenant, the blood that was shed of the, from the animals there could never take away sin. The writer of Hebrews tells us uh, very clearly it could not take away sin. It pointed to, it pictured, it was a promise of the Lamb of God to come. It was a prophecy that Jesus Christ would come and shed His blood. And His blood would once and for all not just cover our sin, but remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. Could take away our sin forever. And we could know a true and a perfect forgiveness of Sin, that New Testament, that new covenant that was established through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance, in remembrance of me. Why did our Lord leave us the ordinance of his supper that we would never forget as his bride? We'd never forget the bridegroom. We'd never forget the price he paid on the cross. We'd never forget that his body was broken for us, that he died for us, that his blood was shed for us to secure forgiveness of sin, to secure eternal salvation, eternal life in remembrance of me. 4, verse 26, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death. That word show there means proclaim. We're proclaiming that Jesus Christ died for us, that He shed His blood for us, that He made the perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, that His body was broken, His blood was shed, He died, He was buried, and He rose again, that our faith, our trust, our hope, our all rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're proclaiming. When we come to the Lord's table and when we partake of the bread, 
We are saying we are identifying with what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Our faith, our hope, our trust, our all rests in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for us. Our faith all rests in the finished work of Jesus Christ. When we take that cup, we are saying we are identifying with the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. We know that He shed His blood for us, establishing the New Testament, the New Covenant, that we have full forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Christ. And so when we come to the table, what are we doing? We are proclaiming. We are proclaiming the perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. The, the perfect price that He paid for us on the cross of Calvary. That's what we're identifying with. When you, when you partake of that, you are saying, I am identifying with Jesus Christ in His finished work All of my hope is in Christ. All of my faith, all of my confidence, all of my weight rests upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. (laughs) That's what we're saying. When we come to this table and we partake of uh, of these elements, what did... uh, Paul say here, he said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show you're proclaiming the Lord's death. That Jesus Christ died to save sinners, yes, but that he died to save me. And my faith is in Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, I'm not ashamed to identify with him. So that's what we're being taught here. We're proclaiming the Lord's death till He come. And as we've said many times, right in the middle of this is the wonderful reminder and the wonderful promise that Jesus Christ, He came the first time and He accomplished the work that the Father sent Him to do. He ascended back to heaven and there he's preparing a place for his bride and he's coming again and he's coming again what a beautiful wonderful promise there is no greater promise right here in the middle of this ordinance that he has left for us so why did the Lord give us this ordinance well my friend this ordinance pictures the gospel of Jesus Christ it pictures what he did for us it's everything Uh, to us the the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ it's everything to us because we're lost apart from it we're we're lost without it without what Christ did for us and this is a reminder to us lest we ever forget lest it ever uh, fall in the recesses of our mind lest the the message ever become Uh, stale to us this is a constant reminder of what our bridegroom has done to secure us as his bride and I want to tell you this makes it special it makes it special when we understand the ordinance of the Lord's Supper wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this is not a light matter. When you understand what this ordinance is, he's saying, wherefore? Understanding that. Understanding that. Understanding all that is represented, all that is portrayed and pictured, all that we are identifying with when we participate in and partake of the Lord's Supper, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, uh, we act as if that's of no consequence. It's no big deal. It's not really that important. We're guilty of not taking 
the body, the broken body of the Lord seriously. We're guilty of thinking lightly of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are given some instruction here and some exhortation here in light of that, lest we take this lightly, lest we be guilty of the body and blood of Christ, let a man examine himself. That means to inspect closely. Let a man examine himself. It means to investigate thoroughly. Why did the Lord leave us this ordinance? I want to tell you that we would regularly examine our hearts in the light of the cross. That we would consistently examine our lives in the light of what Jesus Christ paid, sacrificed in order to secure our salvation. That we would inspect our hearts closely. I've told you before, it's to re, what, what's the purpose of the Lord's table? Yes, it's to remember the Lord. It's also to revive the church, isn't it? It's to revive the church. It's so that, that remembering what my bridegroom did for me to secure my salvation, I would not think of that as a light matter. But I would get before the Lord in the light and in the mirror of His Word and I would inspect my life and my heart closely. I would investigate thoroughly my life as a part of the bride of Jesus Christ. So let a man examine himself, you see. That's one of the reasons He has given us the ordinance of His Supper. That we would examine our hearts carefully and that we would examine our lives consistently and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup may need may be that we need to get some things right it may be that we need to confess sin in our lives it may be sins of commission things that we've done that we know we shouldn't have done it may be sins of omission things that we're supposed to be doing that we know we're not doing we may come to this time of examination and realize we're not being christ-like we're not being obedient to the word of god we're not really living for christ we're living for self we're to examine and investigate and inspect carefully and thoroughly and closely our hearts and our lives in light of the cross. In light of what Jesus Christ has done to take care of our sin. To secure our salvation. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Again, we're not discerning the seriousness, the gravity, the weight of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The seriousness of, of His broken body for us. His shed blood for us. We're, we're treating the matter lightly. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, if we would reflect upon, discern, and determine, and confess, and humble ourselves, and make things right, we should not be judged you see the Lord in his grace and mercy the Lord knows our frame the Lord knows us. he knows our flesh he knows us he knows that there needs to be a, a constant reminder 
before our hearts and our minds, before our souls, of, of the price that he paid for us. He knows that we need a time that we can reflect upon the price he paid and in light of that examine our lives and our, ask ourselves some tough questions about where we're at in our Christian lives, our Christian walk. He, he knew and he knows we'd need these times to, to inspect and to discern and to discover and to, to get still and to get quiet before him. But you know what? My heart's not right with the Lord. I'm not really living for him. I'm just kind of going through the motions, but the passion, the fire, the flame that used to be there is not there. I, I'm not where I ought to be with the Lord. My heart is not wholly sold out to the Lord. There are things in my life that shouldn't be here. There are things that should be here that aren't here. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See, that's why the Lord gives us this time that we would not go on in our disobedience to our own harm, but that we would come together in the light of what He has done for us and we would do some introspection, we would look within our hearts and we would see those areas and we would humble ourselves and we would get those things right such that we don't have to be chastened of the Lord. But that we would judge ourselves and that we would make things right before the Lord. That's His desire for us. That's one of the reasons He left for us the ordinance of His Supper. It's to revive the church. It's to revive us. It's to, to renew our zeal and our passion and our heart for the Lord that, that so easily can grow callous and cold if we're not careful and so we need to examine ourselves we need to examine ourselves we need to remember the Lord we need to remember the bridegroom we need to think upon Christ and we need to ask ourselves are we endeavoring to be like Jesus Christ? Are we endeavoring to live in obedience to His Word? Are we Christ-like? Am I Christ-like as a believer? Well, what was Christ like? Christ is holy. We need to consider that. Christ is righteous. Christ is faithful. Am I Christ-like? Christ is true. Christ is just. Christ is guileless. There's no deceit. There's no deception in Him. He's sinless. He's spotless. He's innocent. He's harmless. <laughs> Christ was victorious over temptation. How are we doing? Are we resisting temptation or are we yielding? Do we care? Christ was obedient and is obedient to God the Father. Are we? <laughs> Christ said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Is that our heart is that our passion is that what drives us moves us motivates us even as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love he was subject to his parents he was zealous wish ye not or know ye not that I must be about my father's business he said the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I do always those things that please Him. 
He was meek. He was surrendered to the Lord's control. Surrendered to the Lord's control. He's merciful. Are we? <laughs> Boy, how, how quickly we judge another. How quickly we're harsh and we're, we're angry and judgmental. We want mercy. But do we show mercy to others? Are we merciful? Christ is gracious. He's long-suffering. He's compassionate. He's benevolent. He's loving. He's self-denying. He's humble. And praise the Lord, He's forgiving. He's forgiving. Are we? You see, when we come together to observe the Lord's table, one of the reasons is so that we would examine ourselves. It's very clear right here introspection we would inspect carefully investigate thoroughly in light of the cross in light of what our savior has done for us maybe we should ask ourselves some questions i just jotted some thoughts down this is not extensive um, it's not all encompassing by any means but it's it's to get us to think. It's to get us to think. One reason he left us this ordinance is to revive us. It's to revive us. So maybe when I come to this table, I should ask myself this. Am I growing? Am I growing? But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Am I growing? Well, I think it, one, this is a wonderful time when we come to this table, when we, when we consider what Christ has done for us and what he continues to do for us and what he's promised he will do for us. We should ask ourselves, are we growing? Or have we sort of hit a plateau in our lives? Uh, things are just sort of stagnant in our lives you know a puddle gets stagnant because there's no fresh water flowing into it have we become just sort of stagnant is everything just sort of status quo are we satisfied or are we growing do we have a desire to grow not only growing are we giving the gospel are we giving the gospel? Folks, that's why we're here, right? That's why we're here. We are here to give the gospel. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're here to preach the gospel. Are we preaching the gospel? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We're here to make disciples. To give the gospel, to see people come to Christ, or at least have the opportunity to come to Christ, and then to disciple them concerning the things of Christ. Or are we just caught up in life and these things not really important to us? We're just about making a living and making a life, and it doesn't really concern us. Are we faithfully and fully ministering and serving? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, listen, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Do you know what that means? Always giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. That's what that means. Always giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Am I faithfully and fully ministering and serving? Are we investing in others? 
Are we investing in others who can carry on the work? So maybe something else we ought to consider. We ought to ask ourselves. Are we investing in others? First of all, if we have children, our own children. But are we investing in others? Are we investing in other believers who can carry on the work? Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witness the same. Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, there were those who invested in me and my life and who shared the gospel with me and then who discipled me and who taught me. You know what I'm to do? I'm to do the same for others. I'm to invest in the lives of others. I'm co- I am to commit the same truth to others that has been committed to me. That's the way it's supposed to work. Am I investing in others? Or am I just investing in myself? And that's really all that matters. Not only that, am I living a holy and godly life? Maybe that's some introspection I should, could, should consider. Am I living a holy and godly life? But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That means in every area of your life. That's what it means. It includes everything and excludes nothing. In all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Or have I let some things slide? Have I become worldly? Have I become carnal? And do I care? We should look forward to Christ's second coming. It's another thing I jotted down. By the way, as we mentioned, it's right here, right? It's right here. And really, all these things are right here. And they're all right here because these are things, all these reasons Christ died for. He died for. These are things we should be doing. But we should look forward to Christ's second coming. Revelation twenty two twenty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Now, realizing that truth, what should we be investing our lives in? What should our priorities be? Maybe that's something we ought to consider in light of what Christ has done for us. Are we investing our lives in that which matters and that which counts? Folks, do we, do we, do I understand why I'm here? Two more things I jotted down. We should be praying for each other. Paul said, brethren, pray for us. He constantly was asking the saints to pray for him. Why? He knew knew that we need to pray for each other. This world is no friend to us. And we need to pray for each other. And we face a lot of obstacles. We should be praying for each other. And then last thing I jotted down, we should be encouraging each other. Are we doing these things? One of the reasons Christ gave us this ordinance is to revive us. It's so that we wouldn't just get off track and continue going the wrong direction, but that we would have a time where uh, remembering, in which remembering what Christ has done for us, the price He paid for our ugly, dirty, rotten sin, That in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we would consider our lives. Are are we fully loving and living for Him and serving Him? Have we gotten sidetracked? Are we off track? Encouraging each other. And let us consider one another. Do we consider one another? Or is it every man for himself? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 
One thing that I should be investing is, is, in is trying to provoke you to love and good works, to love God and to love others and to do what the Bible has commanded us to do. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You can't exhort someone if you're not present, if you're not there. That's why he says don't, don't fail to come together as believers and worship together. You're supposed to consider one another. And considering one another, come together and, and exhort and encourage and edify and build up and, and be a blessing to one another. That's what he's saying. And so much the more. As you see the day approaching. So why did the Lord leave us this ordinance? That we would remember him. And that we would be revived. Remembering him. And considering the price that he paid. To take away our sin. And to secure our eternal life in glory, we would examine our hearts and lives and say, am I where I need to be? Am I where I ought to be? Do I love Him? Am I sold out to Him? Am I surrendered to Him? Is my heart, is my passion, my drive, my motive, my desire to please Him? And that my life would be a constant praise to Him. Am I on track? Am I glorifying God in my life? Father, we thank You for this ordinance You have left for us. I pray we would understand it. I pray, Lord, that tonight, considering what Christ has done for us, Father, we would consider our lives. And Father, if our lives are not where they ought to be, help us to humble ourselves to make things right tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the men to come forward. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Brother Steve Cummings, would you stand and pray and thank the Father for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time when you come before this table. We just thank you for what it represents, Lord. Yeah. The breaking of the body of Christ on the cross of Calvary, Lord. Something that has given us salvation, has given us eternal life through the death of Christ on the cross, Lord. And we just thank you yeah. for his willingness to do that for us, Lord. Unworthy yes. as we may be. Thank you for this time. We pray that you help us to be great testimonies and great witnesses to you during this time in our country. Lord. We just thank you now. Amen. Amen.
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Brother Nate Radel, would you stand and pray and thank the Father for the precious shed blood of Christ tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for uh, how much you loved us, Lord, and what you cost. Mm-hmm. And God, your blood spoke for us, Lord, and we're so thankful for the sacrifice you made for us, Lord, uh, in our place. And it was the only place uh, that was acceptable, Lord, and we're just so thankful yes. that you died for us, Lord. We just pray now that uh, we would take this in relief, Lord, and remember uh, why we are here, Lord. We would not be distracted by blessings and gifts that are abundantly given us, Lord, and we would uh, just remember why we're here, and we just pray for God's healing, and uh, we just pray both of these things through this ministry to us, Lord. We just ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And all God's people said, 
Amen. 450. Four hundred and fifty. Did you know you're royalty? <laughs> you're a child of the king. Amen. Let's stand together and sing it together. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Let's sing the third verse as the last. I once was an outcast stranger on earth. A sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down. An heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Amen, and it doesn't get any better than that, does it? It's been a good day in the Lord's house. We praise the Lord for His goodness and grace upon us. I'll just mention the plates will be by the front doors of the church. The one will be marked benevolence. That's an offering we receive, namely to help those within our own ministry who at times may have special needs. The other offering plate will be for any regular tithes and offerings that you may have this evening. Brother Steve Harmon, would you dismiss us in prayer this evening, sir? <laughs>